Why School? Reclaiming Education for All of Us was written by Mike Rose, who has been teaching since he was 24, ranging from kindergarten to adult literacy programs to graduate school of education. He's done many research projects studying different areas of education and various historical records of different locations and schools around the country. He's collaborated with other educators, administrators, politicians, and other community members in an effort to gain a well-rounded knowledge on the broad-based topic of education. In this book, Rose addresses some of the big questions of public education and what it means to be educated. In each chapter, he begins to answer these questions using his background in teaching and research in psychology. To inform his opinions on the topic of public education, he draws upon his insights regarding history, politics, and educational psychology. As educators, we have the opportunity to reform education. Intelligence, opportunity, and schooling are all a part of the overarching concept of education. Rose states, It matters a great deal how we collectively talk about education, for that discussion both reflects and, in turn, affects policy decisions about what gets taught and tested, about funding, about what we expect schooling to contribute to our lives. It matters as well how we think about intelligence, how narrowly or broadly we define it. Our beliefs about intelligence affect everything from the way we organize school and work to how we treat each other. And it surely matters how we think about, the op about opportunity. Ours is the land of opportunity. That phrase is a core part of our national story. But opportunity is determined by public attitudes and public policy. Mike Rose makes an incredible point about what a profound impact teachers can have on their students when they truly believe in them and put forth as much effort into educating their students as they expect in return. Rose states, looking back on it all, I realized that McFarland's class, in addition to giving direction to my life at the end of high school, would also affect how I teach, the way I understand opportunity, and my hope for what schooling can achieve. It was a course that provided me an abundance of knowledge and skill, but too, the deep emotional satisfaction of using my mind. This just goes to show that students are always watching and always listening. You never know how know the effect you, as an educator, can have on a student, so you better make it count. Rose deals heavily with differences of education in places of wealth versus poverty. Wealthy communities have more to offer students in the sense that they can spend more money on educational programs and extracurricular activities, while more poor communities don't have the same luxuries and tend to produce students who are not as concerned with learning as they are with the bigger things that they have to worry about other than schooling. Rose says, we need to pay attention to the experience of going to school and considering education reform. He believes that it is our experience of an, edu of an institution that determines our attitude toward it, which is incredibly important to keep in mind because the student's attitude toward school will effectively answer the overarching question, why school? He spends a great deal of time expressing how his own education shaped his ideas on the matter. He talks about how each subject taught him something different about the world and our society, which is an incredible example of how important education can be in preparing us and helping us to understand the world. He explains the different ways certain subjects and lessons learned related to various facets of real world experiences. Mike Rose uses part of his book to discuss the ways in which the No Child Left Behind Act and the Race to the Top program have an effect on the education system, accountability and standards in particular. Rose states, accountability is essential to any public institution, but simplified single-shot accountability mechanisms will yield simplified compliance and therefore they need to be scrutinized. He also touches on the interest that education plays in the business world. That aspect is important because schools urge the preparation of a skilled workforce. Rose says, if business truly wants to have a positive effect on the education of our children, the discussion must extend beyond the problems with our school to the economy and culture in which those schools try to do their work. What is knowledge? Who defines being knowledgeable? These are a few of the questions Rose touches upon as he begins to discuss the cultural conflicts of knowledge and how it shapes the identities of many people. Rose argues that in society today, people believe that knowledge is dependent on social class. There has become harsh judgments to the cultures people grow up in and how they are raised, believing that it affects their ability to gain and have knowledge. As a society, we need to be more open to the different ways people obtain information. Mike Rose is a big believer of this, and he says, Think of what it would mean for our civic life and for life in other schools to affirm the bedrock value of knowledge, many kinds of knowledge, machinists to pediatricians, to affirm the wide range of ways people gain and apply knowledge, solve problems, think their way through daily life. As Americans, we do strongly value one form of knowledge. School knowledge over hands-on knowledge has become more of a necessity when applying for jobs. But we need to be more understanding and start to accept the knowledge and ways of learning that all people have. 
Rose thinks this can be done by stepping into the cultural tangles we have and finding common cognitive ground. Rose also questions what intelligence is, a question that is common among educational psychologists. While psychologists such as Howard Gardner and Robert Sternberg have helped with our understanding of intelligence, it is still undervalued and misinterpreted. In public education, testing has begun to define students' achievements and intellectual abilities. We judge people's skills based on the scores they receive on tests. This way of judging intelligence affects the way individuals think about their own abilities and self-worth. As a society, we also have a tendency to judge people's intelligence based off their social class and the work that they do. The economy that we live in today belittles certain forms of work. For instance, any blue collar work or service work is diminished because many insist it does not really rely on any vast body of knowledge. People believe these workers do not have to learn to communicate or problem solve, therefore it does not involve the mind, arriving at the conclusion these workers are just not smart. Rose makes the argument that these frontline workers do rely on all of these skills and more to do their work. Think of a factory worker, for instance. They learn to operate machinery, supply tools, anticipate any issues, and communicate and teach their co-workers. Rose insists they do blend brain and hand. Rose states, in our schools and industries, as well as in our informal talk, we tend to label entire categories of work and the people associated with them in ways that overgeneralize, erase cognitive variability, and diminish whole traditions of human activity. This has also led to our judgment of public schooling versus vocational schooling. The academic curriculum has been identified by society as where intelligence is manifested. But if we continue to put down different types of learning and ways of obtaining it, then there will continue to be a divide in education and employment. As Rose says, if we don't appreciate, if we in some way constrict the full range of everyday cognition, then we will develop limited educational programs. Another issue in education is that as a society, we tend to question the skills of young adults and constantly be anxious about their morals. These worries come from the issues of violence in schools today and lead adults to assume that these young people cannot obtain the basic skills such as literacy, numeracy, problem solving, and even responsibility and punctuality. Having these stereotypes of young people are blinding the way of truly seeing them. Rose, however, makes the point that if we continue to minimize the competence of young people and question their values, it will prevent their true abilities and even stop adults from becoming engaged in their lives. If we were to look more carefully at the work and interests of these young adults, Rose believes we would be able to see their morals and interests arising just from their behavior and even their work in school. In the book, he gives the example of a student constructing a bookcase in class saying that even from this activity, he could begin to see the students' values and interests regarding utility and craft. As education develops, teachers need to begin to focus on the interests of young people, to move them away from the stereotypical behavior of young, young adults and instead provide them more opportunity to do the things they love. Rose states, the development of value occur best in situations where young people are engaged in ongoing, meaningful activity. Schools, as we know, are also very concerned with the idea of standards. What are standards and what are they for? Standards are used to judge competence and are being used every day more than you may pick up on. Standards are used in schooling, sports, voting, cooking, and even raising children. Schools have put them into their curriculum in order to define what students should know every year in grades K through 12 and align instruction. Rose states in his work, the current drive to enact and enforce standards by statistical measures dominates schooling. We are constantly talking and debating this standards movement, but the debate only ever labels them as negative or positive. Rose insists we need to find other ways to talk about the idea of standards in order to help students develop and learn. He spends time looking at both sides of the debate, stating that many people, especially parents and teachers from low-income areas, want more standardized learning in their schools. People from these areas support standardized learning because they want to help further and promote learning abilities and have a maintained way of learning that all teachers and students can draw from. Rose also discusses the negatives to standardized learning. A lot of the time, having standards tends to put down students' abilities and their work instead of encouraging learning. Mike Rose argues, 
Standardized measures can limit the development of competence by driving curricula towards the narrow demands of test preparation instead of allowing teachers to immerse standards in complex problems, solving, and rich use of language. This shows that schools have become so focused on testing and preparing for exams that there is no creativity or discussion of human experience in classrooms. Take a look at this video about standardized learning. Dozens of studies have shown that the kinds of standardized tests we use predict almost nothing about your success later in life. And if you think about it, when have you ever gone to the office and gotten a piece of paper with a set of questions and predetermined answers that you could check off, turn in, and go home because your work is done? <laughs> Has not happened to me. <laughs> or what about a young engineering grad who goes down the street for their first tech job gets their first uh, engineering problem and says, what are my five choices? <laughs> that would be the first and last day on the job for that young person. Uh, and in fact, if you did go down the street to Google, you would in fact uh, not be given a test or asked for your test scores. They used to take that information and transcripts and use that to figure out who to hire, but they discovered when they studied it that there was no correlation between those scores and how people performed on the job. And so today, if you want to apply for a job there, they would be trying to find out about your learning ability. Your... How can we fix the issues of standardized learning and testing and the debate that surrounds it? Rose believes that discussion needs to continue. Those who are constantly worried about the standards need to take the time to see some of the benefits. Having these standards helps to measure learning and see what students still need help with. They also help keep students on the same page, building upon what they have learned each year. Rose wants the discussion of standards to be moved from the negatives and positives of them and instead begin to focus on explaining standards to our students and helping guide them using them as aids. Rose also makes the point that it is vital how teachers use standards in their classroom, believing that the teacher should be less concerned with the subject matter and more concerned about how to help students apply it to their own lives and experiences. By doing this, the discussion can be shifted towards how to use standards to foster competence and help our students strive to be their best selves. Rose takes a strong stance on the importance of remediation at the university level and why these programs are so necessary in the educational system we currently have in place. He discusses how people are always complaining about the lack of preparation students receive before entering an institution of higher education, and how this has led to the general decline of higher education. However, remedial courses play the important role of easing students into higher education who may not have had the proper preparation and may not have been fortunate enough to receive a well-rounded secondary education. As Mike Rose puts it, the overlap of secondary and higher education has been, and remains, necessary in an open, if flawed, educational system. Higher education in America has expanded swiftly through the centuries and has become more accepting and accommodating of the diverse population of students. This diversity means that there are going to be students entering higher education with all different sorts of backgrounds and experiences. For this reason, remedial courses are necessary if all students are to be given a fair chance at success within the realms of higher education. If these remedial courses are taken away, then the chances of a higher education are being taken away from a large portion of Americans. These courses serve a very crucial role and ensure that each child is getting a fair chance at pursuing a higher education. Rose delves further into the topic of remediation by specifying what successful remediation looks like and the benefits that good remedial courses can have. Many politicians use the students who are underperforming to make the claim that higher education is being compromised by these remedial courses. However, the material that these students have yet to master is not being taught to them in the same way in these remedial programs as it was taught to them the first time around. The whole purpose of remediation is to change the environment and style in which the material was ineffectively taught the first time so that the student is introduced to it in a new light. According to Rose, good remediation programs set high standards, are focused on inquiry and problem solving in a substantial curriculum, utilize a pedagogy that is supportive and interactive, draw on a variety of techniques and approaches, and are in line with student goals and provide credit for coursework. 
These remedial programs offer up a second chance to students who come from less privileged backgrounds and who did not receive effective instruction in their secondary educational experiences. Research findings are not concrete, but they do suggest that students who do not enter into higher education entirely underprepared are more successful when given the opportunity to partake in these remedial courses. The education system we have is imperfect and has many failures in ways in which it lets students down. Offering these remedial programs ensures that the system's failures are not being taken out on the students, and the concept of offering a second chance when it comes to education very much falls in line with the values of the democratic society we live in. Rose also takes the time to address a topic that is often swept under the rug, and that is veterans in the classroom and how to properly educate them and meet their unique set of needs. The main thing that must be taken into account when thinking about how to educate veterans who are returning home is that they have psychological, social, and economic needs that must be met as well. Rose discusses a specific program for veterans called the Veteran Special Education Program. This program uses tutoring to support the work in the course, provides resources for psychological counseling, and pushes their students by following up with them when days are missed or when the students feel like giving up. All of this combined creates a supportive community of veterans who encourage one another and who understand one another's struggles. According to Rose, this program was formed through a course of study that was intensive, generous with assistance, and geared toward the next phase of the veterans' lives. The value of this program really lies within the future-oriented style of the program that gives these veterans something concrete to work towards and hope for. Rose really emphasizes that these veterans are a special population of people that must be educated in a different way than we choose to educate the general public. Having a variety of intervention techniques is the best way to support this community of people who we owe our time and attention. While going on a personal journey through our nation's public schools, Rose searched for something that he thinks is largely missing, hope. He talks of how our nation has become incredibly cynical when it comes to discussing public education, and how this must change and we must continue to find reasons to be hopeful. He talks of how he visited classrooms all across the country, and in each one he found exceptional educators, children who were excited to learn, and a multitude of reasons to be hopeful. He makes the argument that we must adjust the way that we choose to talk about our schools because the blind anger that is used right now is simply unproductive. Rose says, What I am suggesting is that we lack a public critical language adequate to the task. We need a different kind of critique. What Rose is implying is that our public schools need change, and change requires criticism. However, that criticism needs to be constructive, and the language we use needs to reflect a desire to solve the problems in our public schools, not just to tear it apart. As Rose says, safety, respect, expectation, opportunity, vitality, the intersection of heart and mind, the creation of civic space. This should be our vocabulary of public schooling. We need a vocabulary that reflects these values because changing the way we talk about our public school system is the only way to ignite the hope that we so desperately need. When looking for the good in our public schools, Rose truly believes that it is to be found in the small details of the classroom. He notes that it is easy to get caught up in the politics of education and the testing that is so heavily emphasized, but that there's a great deal of value to be found in the small details of classroom life, such as in the techniques of an exceptional teacher or the curiosity and creativity of students. Rose claims that neither the sweeping rhetoric of public school failure nor the narrow focus on test scores helps us here. Both exclude the important, challenging work done daily in schools across the country, thereby limiting the educational vocabulary and imagery available to us. By focusing on these large-scale failures of the public school system, we are failing to account for all the small-scale successes that happen on the daily in classrooms all around the country. Rose makes a call for action to reevaluate the way that public school education is talked about and the work to enhance it. In his eyes, the way to do this is to take a closer look at the details of classroom life 
and focus on all the daily successes that take place in these settings that are oftentimes overlooked. Why School by Mike Rose is a book fueled by questions about education that Rose argues are important to continually revisit and rethink so that we can attempt to better answer them. Some of these questions that he deems important to think about have to do with how to educate a vast population, how to bring schooling to all, what to teach and how to teach it, who will do it, and what the work will mean to them. These are big and complex questions, which is why it is so important to continually reassess them and think through better ways of answering them. Schools have become far too focused on finances, standardized testing, and how students are performing on these tests. And in the process, they've lost sight of the real reason that we send our youth to school. In his book, Rose attempts to recapture the true essence of why we go to school and why the way that we talk about school and public education matters. As Rose puts it, the way that we talk about school affects what we put in or take out of the curriculum and how we teach that curriculum. And all of this affects the way we think about each other and who we are as a nation.